Итак, друзья, давайте начнем нашу работу. Я попрошу всех выключить свои телефоны. We need to start our work here. Please turn off your mobile devices. Let me remind you. Let me remind you that this is our ninth international conference called the Zinoviev Readings, devoted to post-Sovietism, post-capitalism of Alexander Zinoviev. What kind of uh, social and political system do we want and uh, can we create? I apologize for the delay. One of the entrances uh, to the building is being repaired, and we have two hours for this first session. We are really pressed for time, and this conference is organized by Zinoviev Club of uh, Russia Sivodnya, an international news agency. And now let me give the floor to the co-chair of this uh, club, uh, Olga Zinovieva, for her opening remarks. Dear friends, colleagues, comrades, first of all, today we celebrate, and at least, I mean those who are over 50, we celebrate the centennial of uh, the Lenin Union of Youth. And this is a pretty important event. This century has been hard for us. There were many events, emotional events. But last year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution. This year, it's the centennial of uh, Komsomol. And if you ever were a Komsomol member in the 40s, 50s and 60s, please uh, raise your hand and so that we could uh, celebrate. Our readings uh, have been or were started the next year after the death of Alexander Zinoviev, and he would turn 96 on this day. It's a special occasion for me. And if you have time tomorrow, please come to the Novodevichy Cemetery at 11 and pay tribute to the grave of uh, this great Russian thinker. OK, 11 o'clock AM, Novodevichy uh, Cemetery. According to our agenda, we were supposed to have some special ceremony. All right, we could start with uh, Bolshakov. Let me invite to uh, the stage Mr. Vladimir Bolshakov, who used to be a Pravda correspondent in Paris, where he uh, became friends with Mr. Zinoviev. And this is rather unexpected turn of events. Uh, quite recently, as I was, l as he was scanning through his uh, archives, he found 12 handwritten pages of uh, Zinoviev written in his uh, specific handwriting. And I'd like him to read these pages for us instead of the, uh, the words of introduction. <laughs> Good morning and just a couple of words in the way of introduction. Zinoviev used to say, I am a state of one man. I was able to get a visa to this country in December 1989 in Nice, where a conference was organized, uh, devoted to disinformation. 
and uh, Zinovio spoke at that conference and this was the first interview that I uh, got with him for the Pravda newspaper. The uh, interview was published in uh, December and that's how the process of uh, his return to Russia started. It was a little bit delayed even though Gorbachev personally wanted to see him, Zinoviev already wrote his uh, Katastroika uh, book, which sort of postponed his return. We uh, talked and I used uh, the recorder sometimes personally, sometimes uh, uh, by phone, and these handwritten notes that I discovered recently are dated August 26, uh, 1994. He simply wrote answers to some of my questions in his uh, specific handwriting. Let me read this out to you. They are deliberately uh, changing everything that has to do with Russia and the Russian nation in the West. They're trying to humiliate them and insult them. The history of mankind never knew anything like that in such a huge scale. There are different motives intertwined here. Uh, it's both fear of former threats and attempt to take revenge and the desire to overemphasize their own achievements by uh, trying to ignore the contribution of Russians and Russia and the desire to hide their own defects and crimes and the desire to kill the uh, downed opponent and the fear of the restoration of communism and regular human uh, meanness. But the most, uh, the worst in all this I is that the so-called democratic coup d'etat is over, but they were not sure that the Soviet communist uh, system would be able to uh, restore or survive. My ideas on that were not categorical. They were problematic, but now I am convinced that I am deeply convinced that communism in Russia and the Soviet Union will not uh, be restored for two or three generations, and most probably they will never be revived in their po former uh, form. It's only ideological discussions, if anybody talks about it, trying to convince themselves that we as Russia will uh, be revived, that we have seen worse. Uh, but it doesn't help people. It uh, brings about this passive approach, hoping that everything will come, will be done by itself. The communist ideology and the communist movement formed by Marxism have uh, played its historical role. The practice of real communism discredited Marxism and its social ideas uh, for the human masses, because these masses believed that real communism was the uh, manifestation of those ideals. Marxism as a social teaching stopped being adequate to reality. It's enough to say that the social structure of uh, the population changed uh, drastically, both in the West and in the former communist countries. The working class 
lost its role in the society that it used to have in the past. The parties based on certain classes are no longer possible. The communist parties lost their special features, primarily their desire to change the society in a revolutionary form and many items of their reforms have become a commonplace in uh, various uh, programs and demagogical uh, rumblings giving enough excuse to those uh, phenomena that we are talking about. As for Russia, communists and communism-like organizations are still possible on the ruins of uh, the CPSU, which was a state uh, organization rather than a political party, something I wrote about in the 1970s. Under the influence of uh, Western parties, they were trying to mimic those uh, Western parties, trying to copy them. They have no ideology that would be based on the scientific understanding of real communism. The best that they can do as communist organizations would be obvious or hidden uh, attempts to restore the past, but that's not enough to put together uh, a strong and promising communist movement. Perhaps we could uh, stop here. Thank you very much. During every conference that we organize, we have a special uh, moment or event. We give letters of gratitude, awards related to the works or life of Mr. Zinoviev. And let me invite to the stage Vladimir Semyonov. I hope he is in the room or oh, will join us later. Yuri Bashko is running late. Alexander Zinoviev Intellectual Award for 2018 is awarded to Vladimir Lepichin. Fortunately, I'm not late. I got a few awards in my life, but this is a special one because it's uh, an intellectual one. I get it from Olga Zinoviev. An award in literature. This is a novelty for this year. We change with the time and space that we live in. We are flexible enough and lively enough. This is a an award for literature, and it's given to Mikhail Friedman. Please, if you could could come up uh, to the stage. I uh, saw him personally. I'm sure he is around. Let's uh, postpone it for a few moments. And now, allow me to start with some formal opening remarks. 
We're talking about the destiny of mankind and the just world. Dear participants in the ninth International Zinoviev readings taking place here traditionally at the international news agency Rasi Sivodnya. I'm proud that from the first day of our activities, the Zinoviev Club tried to promote the term multipolar world in Russia and the rest of the world. And people distrusted it at first, but today this term is widely used. It is the dominating discourse of Russia and the term that our president, Vladimir Putin, uses a lot. This is our contribution to building a just world on the planet Earth. And my call to uh, stop feeding the Wall Street was also heard. Russia decreased its investments into uh, U the U.S. Uh, Treasury bonds to almost zero. Russia doesn't want to pay tribute anymore to the insatiable American golden horde. I am convinced, and I hope you share this opinion, that without the intellectual position of Alexander Zinoviev, and by the way, we are now uh, commemorating 40th anniversary since his banishment from his uh, motherland, without his impact on the minds of several generations of global intellectuals, some of whom are present, today in this room. These are our friends from Europe. The modern history would be the hostage of this deadly single-track line of the Anglo-Saxon track. And since everything is planned, we would lose any alternative uh, projects of, for the development of the civilization. We are convinced that capitalism did not cope with this burden of trying to govern the Earth with a population uh, over 7.6 billion people. That's why the disbalanced world is bursting at the seams and crumbling right in front of us. And its architects are now looking towards east and witnessing how China is winning in this race against post-capitalist uh, West. And uh, we have our guests from China here as well. The evolution of uh, mankind in the form of revolutionary change of post uh, eras has the result that people have to uh, live in several post eras at the same time post industrial post ideological post -commu communist post capitalist post human in the time of post uh, truth and post uh, god knows what as alexander zinoviev used to say it's quite obvious that here we mean the evolution of western countries because the rest of humanity is only considered as long as it follows the Western countries, mimics them, and tries to uh, be like them. Most people live in misery without any times or eras or post-eras, but it, matter, it does not matter to those people. They look at those who run ahead, no, not at those who lag behind. Communism appeared in the reality of Russia in the 20th century uh, thanks to a unique uh, turn of events. But let me repeat this idea once again. Communism uh, was born in a certain situation, but then the situation changed. It fought for survival for a number of decades, but it wasn't strong enough in the new conditions and the conditions that are required for its appearance disappeared and would never re-emerge again. For them to return, we need the world back in the state that it had before the Russian Revolution, but that's impossible by the laws of society and history. Dear participants in our readings, let's turn to the creative uh, legacy of Alexander Zinoviev. Uh, the Russian people was a great nation. And uh, some of you got uh, Alexander Zinoviev's book, The Global Human Hill. Alexander Zinoviev calls the uh, Russian nation, the Russian people, Russoids, because the word Russians, as in, in that novel, lost its, its ethnic meaning and became a common name for uh, 
multiple ethnicities. So why did the Russian people, the Russians disappear as a nation? Why was it erased in such a way? The uh, writer asked in his novel. And one of the main characters um, of this novel said that this people did not just uh, disappear, did not just die out. It was the result of intentional efforts of the West and its global acolytes. Uh, and it was actually destroyed by major uh, nations uh, of the planet. But Regarding the Russoids, this Russian nation, the, the, it was a unique situation. They w created a communist social regime, and it was a deadly threat uh, to the existence of the Western uh, style of um, politics and regime. And um, this character from the human hill uh, follows and goes on to say that um, this uh, led to the degradation and to the dying out of the Russoids. And uh, the West believes that the preservation of Russoids as a great people is a constant threat of the revival of communism. Who knows, maybe there will be a, a second attempt for communism when it will be able to win global dominance uh, which would mean a lot of negative consequences for the West. So these people should not be just uh, eliminated, it should be also forgotten, uh, with no trace of it left in history. So the Russians, who were guided by the principle of being, were infected with the principle of having that came from the West. This led to the destruction of the Russian mentality and the destruction of the soul of a whole, of an entire nation. This is similar to what happened in America and with the local indigenous populations with the arrival of Europeans. This was a warning that Alexander Zinoviev made in the Human Hill a novel he wrote 21 years ago. The 20th century was probably the most dramatic one in the history of humankind in terms of the people, nations, ideas, social systems and civilizations. But even though it was a century of uh, personal, of uh, human drama, of hopes and uh, despair, of illusions and uh, temptations and disillusionment, it was the last human century, and it uh, will be followed by the centuries of superhumanity, a history deprived of uh, hopes and despair, of illusions and uh, temptation and disillusionment, without joy or sorrow, without love or hatred. So the West should not be able to eliminate the Russoids, uh, the Russian people. R Russian people should not become a thing of the past. Uh, we should not be uh, transformed into a digital concentration camp, into a caste society of sterile fascism, where stat statuses and roles will be uh, genetically engineered into specific people. The destiny of humankind is a fair world and not capitalism. I now see Mikhail Friedman in this room. You were not there when we wanted to award you and now please I invite you to the stage. A literature award uh, named after Alexander Zinoviev for 2018 is awarded to Mikhail Friedman. Oh, this is a surprise. So the topic of our Zinoviev readings are really uh, research driven and very topical. Last year we discussed the outcomes and the aftermath of the October Revolution and we had a very lively debate on this subject. We will also have a lot of lively debates here 
It is 100 years since the beginning of the Civil War, 50 years in of, from what happened in Western Europe with the emergence of the new left. And if we look at the dates, uh, the Bolsheviks did not come to power in October 1917, but uh, in 1918, actually, in February, when there was this Council of Workers and Peasants, and a new regime was created. So uh, we can say that in 2018, we are celebrating the centenary of the emergence of a new political um, regime. And we are, uh, we can mark the century of uh, this process. So this subject uh, that we're discussing, the post-Sovietism and post-capitalism for Zinoviev, which uh, kind of social and political system do we want to create? This is a very topical uh, subject. Every speaker has some thing to say, I believe, but in order to have an interactive debate, I will a be asking questions and I will just ask our speakers uh, to keep these questions in mind when they deliver their remarks. Um, so the first question is an obvious one. Is there any alternative to capitalism? Is capitalism an um, eternal um, phenomenon? If socialism has a future, uh, what should it be? What should it look like? And if we're looking beyond capitalism, between so, uh, beyond socialism, uh, and uh, if we have China in mind, there's an example when capitalist and socialist uh, traits uh, were combined within a single system, within a single country, and uh, we will have a special breakaway se session on um, China and um, there will be also a third panel where everyone will be able to take the floor and now I would like to open the floor for our speakers and I would like to start with Dimitris uh, Patelis uh, this is a um, unique person, he is a PhD in philosophy he graduated uh, from the faculty of philosophy of the Moscow State University uh, I believe uh, he's one of the top Western European philosophers. He took part in the Novyev readings uh, two, twice already and he was always very well received by the audience. So I would like to open uh, this um, interactive debate with his remarks. So about 10 minutes for your presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. I did not expect uh, to speak first. And um, I thought that I will respond, to f will follow up on some of the things that were said. But uh, from what I've already heard today, and um, I thank the previous speakers for their contributions, I see that um, we are facing major momentous uh, tasks. And overall, uh, this is not just a rhetorical question that we're discussing. This is a question of life and death for the humankind. And it is from this perspective that we must look at this topic. Uh, this is not just about uh, some uh, intellectual discussion, speculation for intellectual, for philosophers who have nothing else to do. Uh, these are momentous uh, challenges that humanity faces. Uh, uh, this is a question of the future of the humanity. So for this reason, as I have already said at the previous readings, and it is uh, very important that the Zinoviev Club offers a platform for international dialogue on global matters uh, and uh, This is not just about bringing together um, the supporters of one idea or another, but this is about finding uh, constructive, effective solutions. And um, from this point of view, I will be honest when I say that uh, 
I have a specific take on Zinoviev's works. I can say from the outset that I belong to a different uh, school of thought. Uh, I um, belong to the logic and history school that was established by Mr. Vazulin, uh, a, a prominent um, philosopher from the Moscow State University. He was a little younger than Zinoviev, but they knew each other. And let me remind you that Zinoviev wrote his uh, thesis uh, on his vision on, on moving from uh, abstract to, to concrete in the capital of Marx. And my research director uh, also uh, had a lot of um, papers written on this uh, uh, subject, including the logic of capital, Marx's capital. So at the time, there were the same uh, ideas that were in the air. There were different approaches of treating them. There are various schools of thought that um, emerged, but uh, the direction of thought uh, was the same. There was this uh, lo this debate on the logics and on the methodology of uh, on these uh, subjects. There will be specific uh, reports uh, on the methodology, but this is not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is that the we are facing this major uh, task, major challenge as a person with a good sense of humor and with a uh, very rich talent, Alexander Zinoviev uh, was able to understand uh, the essence, the gist of times, and to understand the times he lived in, and uh, to was able to classify and to introduce terms that could be used to describe these, um, what happened around him. So this is conceptually very important. Uh, what matters the most is that Zinoviev was able to articulate Im very important questions, and I hope that I am not mistaken. Uh, to a large extent, uh, Zinoviev is still alive, and when he lived in the West, uh, he tried to adapt uh, his uh, terminology to the Western thinking. Um, well, he did not give up on any of his ideas, so he, he, he just wanted to understand how he can influence this thought. So I would not call what is happening as post-Sovietism or post-capitalism. But uh, this is understandable. Just look at the po post-modernism or post-industrial society in the West. Uh, uh, people in the West understand these concepts, so um, these terms are used. Uh, and how can we reach um, um, ordinary people, rank and file intellectuals, if you wish, if you use a terminology that people are not familiar with? So why do we oppose these terms of post-Sovietism and post-capitalism? Is uh, because there is this idea of uh, negative uh, determination, negative determinism. It is clear f from where we are going, but it's not clear where we are actually heading. We have to understand where we are going, uh, where we are heading. There is a lot of questions, uh, uh, and maybe I will take up this uh, subject later on. Uh, in terms of the f logics. But this is not what I wanted actually uh, to highlight in my remarks. Uh, it is a fact uh, that, as Zinoviev said, uh, people like Marx, Engels, or Lenin, uh, and to some extent Stalin, uh, they did their work and did it in an outstanding manner. And, but the times changed, and changed radically. Well, it is, to some extent, Marxism is no longer relevant. And uh, it is a 
not relevant in the sense that it predicted in a scientific manner uh, the future of capitalism and its, some of its characteristics. Uh, uh, Marxism in its historical form ceased to be relevant uh, because the humanity no longer faces the same goals. It is no longer a question of building an alternative for the humanity. This was the objective for the Soviet Union in early socialism. We were called, referred to as early socialists. They were, the classics did not have this objective. The most, uh, the best of the researchers cannot do research on a subject that does not exist. So, uh, of course, you have to have this uh, high side, this ability to predict. Uh, and in this sense, we have to note that in the society, there are some patterns that we can see. There are some laws, social laws, that are f shaped by history. Uh, Zinoviev refers to them as evolutionary laws, the laws of evolution. I do not agree with this notion because evolution is a process that is relatively linear. And if there is a qualitative change, these changes are uh, not radical, they are gradual. Evolution is about development and development uh, implies all the laws of dialectics and all the dialectic patterns uh, like the qualitative uh, leaps, uh, the contradictory nation of uh, the phenomenon and the negation of the negation, but not in the sense uh, of the um, concepts uh, that we find in the textbooks that have nothing to do with the real world, but in terms of the patterns that emerge and that we have to study on a system-wide basis. And in this sense, I think that there are clear patterns. And Zinoviev took note of many of these patterns, and this is his uh, contribution, and this is his accomplishment. There were very few people who were able to see with such clarity uh, the challenges that humanity faced. He speaks about the super-society. What does he, um, how does he see this notion? He is talking about the generalization of uh, production, of manufacturing. Uh, and uh, this leads uh, to the need of uh, a planified economy. This is not about the willpower. This is not about what some just want or are looking for the technology of the labor and the organization of labor in the world requires another um, a new approach uh, to management. The 20th century gave birth to two major types or standards for these development patterns. And I insist on this term of using the term of uh, development, not evolution. There is this Soviet m model of uh, a planned economy for early socialism and the Western capitalist uh, type. And to a large extent, this Western approach to planning was uh, defined by the opposition to the alternative uh, that threatened the very existence of capitalism. And not, this refers not only to the 20th century. Look at uh, the uh, perceived threat of the Great Revolution. How does the West perceive the threat of any revolution, uh, their existential horror of any revolution? And uh, to a large extent, uh, the transnational monopolistic uh, capitalism that we see in the West uh, was uh, uh, created as an alternative to the Soviet Union, to the early socialism. To the, on the other hand, the early socialism did not 
have the potential for completing this uh, and coming to the end of the pat pattern of uh, planning. And this is a separate conversation and this was, uh, this con um, these ideas were especially relevant in 1950s or 60s when uh, there was this goal of from moving from an ex um, extensive to an intensive uh, development model. The society or the leadership were not ready for this transition. The conditions were not in place for these transitions and they still continued to follow the same old pattern and start lagging behind the West. So this was not just a choice uh, to destroy the Soviet Union, but there was, of course, yes, efforts to destroy the Soviet Union. There was the fifth column, we have to admit that, but there were also uh, inner contradictions and they were unable to resolve all these uh, logical contradictions of the development of the socialist society and moving the society towards a united uh, humankind, humanity. Communism is the prospect for uniting the humankind. Look at what, what Marx wrote there about communism. Now they're uh, scaring people with this word uh, communism, but communism is uniting people and who are against uniting people, those who uh, benefit from segregation, who uh, divide and who like to divide and conquer, uh, divide and rule. And there was another idea of Zinoviev, how Zinoviev treats this whole set of, of post-Sovietism, post-capitalism and the war, the imminent, the permanent war at this stage of uh, global imperialism, or globalism, no matter how you call it. The war that follows its own logic. If we look at uh, that empirically, uh, history seems to have individual battles and wars, like the Prussian-French uh, War, Napoleon Wars, World War One, World War too, but if we look deeper into it in terms of what kind of objectives they had and how the war uh, kept developing and growing to deal with the imminent uh, contradictions of the global system, then we will see that we only have one war which is a local part for the development of uh, antagonistic capitalistic society. World War I resulted in an alternative for the development of the humanity. What happened in the Soviet Union and Soviet Russia. Uh, world War II was the continuation of World War I. Uh, they had pretty much the same objectives, plus they wanted to destroy the alternative way, the Soviet Union. Why didn't the Allies uh, interfere? directly, indirectly supporting Hitler and Axis. The Axis was called anti comintern uh, Axis and Hitler was fighting that alternative. They, uh, they waited until the last moment only when they realized that the Red Army uh, would be able to get all the way to Paris independently, then, only then, they interfered. And then, immediately after World War II, World War III started. It actually started in my country of uh, Greece. In September, October 1944, and the British replaced uh, the Germans as conquerors of my country and now my country is still colonized by the Americans now with all their military bases and those who worked for the fascists for Germans now work for the Americans. If we look at the 
historical realities through this prism, you will see how it's one single uh, continuous process. And Zinoviev was quite right here when he formulated those ideas and objectives. As I conclude, let me say this. We and who are we? What are we? We need to be very precise and research driven about our strategy, about where we're going and who or what are we. When I say we, I mean those people, those teams and collectives who objectively and deliberately as they mature as actors understand that promoting and continuing with capitalism would be self-destruction for humans. We used to talk about two forms of self-destruction of humanity uh, brought about by capitalism. Form number one is a total war and the uh, murdering of all people on Earth. And the second one is the environmental form of self-destruction by being over greedy about the natural resources. And what Zinoviev also uh, wrote about in his books, there's a new form of self-destruction for humanity, which is connected with the fact that certain centers are trying to take over the strategic initiative and use for their own interests these opportunities to plan and they use this opportunity of uh, comprehensive total control and it's a whole set of manipulative uh, techniques leading to a literal biological mutation of the human species as they look for new biotechnologies to create this superhuman and such efforts are already been taken and that's on the one hand on the other hand is trying to destroy the existential foundations of human beings killing its biological core it killing our personality, our families, destroying the identity of humanity, breaking the backbone which the backbone of our personality. And, and these are no jokes. Uh, if we read Marx and Engels, communism, the united humanity, is the stage for the development of uh, mankind when comprehensive development of every person is the foundation for the development of everyone and if we break the core the backbone of such process what kind of prospects for the future of humanity can we talk about there are three strategic forms of destroying humanity and we have to fight them Otherwise, we will not survive. I fight for communism, for the unification of mankind, of old forms of this fight for communism exhausted themselves and the attempts to restore the past are futile. When you look back into the past, it never worked. There are some young people here. 
are you ready to follow those old timers who still miss the lost paradise of the Soviet Union? Yes, it may be touching, but it's not the way to the future. We are the future because if we want to unite humankind, we want to turn our ways of production to science-driven, research-driven ways. And we need to do that for the survival of our species. Thank you. Yes, you're quite right. The destiny of uh, mankind is in our hands now. But you uh, spoke about communism as you spoke about communism as uh, a unifying process, but here I would disagree. Uh, glo global capitalism also wants to unite uh, humanity. And when when we talk to our youth, we want to hear about what's beyond uh, capitalism. What's the alternative? The presenter uh, started to talk about this only at the last moment, and I hope that the next presenters will uh, give it some thought. And let me give the floor to a well-known Italian uh, writer and uh, speaker, uh, participants in our participant in our Zenovic readings for a number of years, Mr. Giulietto Chiesa. Good afternoon. It's really hard when you only have five minutes to tell you everything that I, I will give you ten minutes. Okay. Thank you. That's better. I heard for the first time those uh, quotes from Zinoviev that our first uh, speaker uh, presented. I never heard about those prophetic words of Zinoviev. And as we, as I think about what I heard from Dmitrius, I share uh, his opinion, and my thoughts are even more radical. What uh, comes after capitalism? And here's my answer. Uh, what we see today is no longer capitalism, in my opinion. It's a totally different structure that changed all our previous ideas formed in the 19th and 20th century. Capitalism was about production of goods an exchange of goods, an exchange of goods for money and back. And there's no, there are no goods in our case, only money. Money produces money. Can we call it capitalism? I don't think so, because all the consequences that you heard about are far away from us. The end of capitalism means the end of all previous ideas of class struggle. There's no class struggle anymore, at least in the West. In the world, yes, there is some, but that's an intermediary situation. I will try to explain that later, what I mean by this expression. Post-capitalism, what does it mean? Or what kind of political and social system we can and we want to build. Okay, we need to decide what kind of system uh, we want, but more, more importantly, what are we capable of doing and what can we do? There is no class struggle within the system. It's hard to f invent this form 
who are we going to fight against or what are we going to fight against what can we do uh, sitting here uh, the old and the young what can we do in the west one billion people have been conditioned have been formatted by this device this system is reformatting our brains and the new generation is a hundred percent there we are old we are only halfway there but the new generation uh, as I as I uh, used the metro this morning I saw all these people uh, looking into their smartphones and that's trying to condition human brains human mentality human thinking and our time has been formatted a long time ago and it this process continues quickly Dmitrius said how we have this important task let's try to figure out what is this objective do we want to make what do we want to unite humanity it's almost impossible anything that's happening is developing so fast and we don't have enough time to organize our defenses if you want to be if you want me to be sincere with you the most probable result of the situation is war global huge massive unlimited war I'm not saying it will happen for sure I'm just saying if we can well, but but I, I mean that this is the most uh, probable outcome we are in a global situation where this technological process that changed the v entire route of our life and we'll have to figure out what's happening and now the uh, humankind is split into two unequal parts the rich one the a very narrow group of people it, it's only a few hundred people who who control the world and on the other hand we have 7.6 or 7.7 .7 billion people and they cannot respond they are preconditioned their brain has been formatted has been uh, e exhausted and this is an anthropological mutation the speed of this process can be determined with uh, enough precision there's this one expert, uh, Mr. Kurz, uh, well, and his uh, brain is already connected with this new computer. They're building a uh, building for his brain. And Kurzweil used to, uh, he, he wrote a, a very interesting book a while ago. In that book, he says, this entire process will continue until I'm not sure how it is in Russian until we reach a singularity when will we reach singularity in 20 years he says in 20 uh, 25 or 50 years and the life of all those young people who sit here they will see the singularity and I think that Kurtzweil's predictions are quite uh, true 
not based on philosophy, but rather on how he monitors the movement of capital. This is a quantitative, uh, not qualitative analysis. In 20 years, the new superhuman will be ready. And it means, as Stephen Hawking said before he died, Stephen Hawking said it's going to happen when billions of people uh, will be reformatted. So can you imagine a situation when 200 people will determine uh, the fate of 7 billion people, more than 7 people, they will not uh, be renovated So uh, s humans will cease to be human, actually, as you have said. So half of a human being, 50% or even more, uh, will be artificial intelligence and will cease to be human. And the reason for that, among others, is that artificial intelligence thinks much faster than a human brain and that makes all the difference if you compare the speed at which a human brain works and the speed of an artificial intelligence you, uh, you can't compare the two it will be a mistake uh, so you cannot uh, uh, compare uh, human intelligence to artificial intelligence. It cannot be compared to human intelligence. And let me uh, refer once again to Stephen Hawking. When this will happen, he says it will happen within this century. And Kurzweil uh, is speaking about a um, time span of 20 years due to the acceleration of these uh, developments. Uh, so when this happens, uh, artificial intelligence will think, uh, will have this thought, do we need humans at all? So this is where we are now. This is not a question of what will happen in a century. This is already a very uh, important uh, subject right now. So the last point I wanted to make is uh, has to do with experimental proof i come from italy i was in italy yesterday what is happening in in fact what we're seeing in italy is a revolution this is how i can call it what the forces are behind this revolution there are actually no forces whatsoever opposition parties do not exist there are 14 communist parties in Italy. Just imagine that there are very small, tiny parties that have no influence whatsoever. Other classes uh, are not represented. The leaders themselves, uh, they are not the masters of the world. They are like uh, employees. They ha do not understand what is going on. What we're seeing is that uh, with without the leadership, uh, entire nations are beginning to ask themselves what is going on. There is no theoretical uh, advice they're getting. What do they have to do? This is like dogs barking ahead of an earthquake. This is an interesting uh, uh, metaphor. Uh, dogs feel in advance, they have sensors of some kind, they uh, can uh, detect an uh, earthquake before it happens. So before it happens, they start barking. This may have, this is happening in Italy, in Germany, the entire Europe is uh, barking. Uh, the old the political structures are no longer there. People do not know how to protect themselves, but they feel the danger. So we're in the situation when the government of Italy is a revolutionary government of sorts. Uh, 
but uh, that does not know what to do because they have to break the system but it is hard to break it actually because everything works very efficiently and effectively so this is the problem and this is uh, the last point I wanted to make uh, uh, how can we resist? I would like to end on an optimistic note. Uh, one single person cannot resist on his or her own. This requires funds, uh, organizational ca uh, capability, and the state is needed. What countries can resist these developments? Uh, two or three. China, Russia, Iran. These three forces are the only forces that can accumulate knowledge, if they're still able to. They can bring together knowledge and build a system of common resistance and defense. Otherwise, there will be war. The war will be inevitable because those who dominate, they do not uh, view us as uh, humans. Uh, for them, we are not even a production capability. We're also uh, biomass and nothing more. So for this reason uh, we need force. So we're in Russia. Are there leaders in Russia who can think at this level? I do not know. This is a question. This is a question that we have. Uh, we can find these leaders if we want to. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chiesa. This was not really optimistic, actually. You said that uh, what we have today is not capitalism, but capital is uh, changing. It used to be trade capitalism, then industrial capitalism, financial capitalism, then information technology capitalism, and we can come up with new terms uh, that reflect uh, uh, these uh, developments in the capitalist society. But how can we resist if we do not agree? You say war and that there is no other option and that people in Europe do not know what to do. We had already two uh, editions of a book in Russia waiting for the leader. And I started looking at this book and in the abstract, I read that Europe is waiting for a leader with, that will offer a development strategy that will, will counter the capitalist narrative. It's just the editor that came up with this abstract and there was nothing about this in the book actually. So I wanted to, to know about the fate of capitalism, whether it is uh, evolving or transforming. We have our friend Dimitris said that uh, about the end of this capitalism, about the environmental disaster. These are very important ideas. Uh, our friend from China, Wang Haiting, uh, maybe is not as pessimistic as the other speakers uh, in terms of what he thinks about the future and maybe he believes that China is an alternative for the self-destructive forces of humankind. But before he speaks, I would like to pass the floor to another philosopher, Todor Todorov, uh, who is also a professor, a doctor of philosophy from the Sofia University. He also took part in Zinoviev readings in the past, and I would like to ask him to share his perspective on the questions we are discussing. First, uh, let me first answer the question you put uh, at the beginning. Uh, yes, there is an end uh, uh, to capitalism, but there is maybe something worse uh, coming after. And uh, maybe this is our only hope. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, first, there is no way to predict how capitalism will develop and uh, how it will possibly end, because capitalism is maybe the most dynamic, the most adaptive, the most changing, the most vital social, economic, and cultural form that we know and, uh, up till now. 
So uh, we see that, uh, like in the research of Brodeau, we see different forms of capitalism, starting from the Mediterranean, the Venetian capitalism. Then we have di uh, today we have a digital capitalism. Uh, so maybe we, there is no way to predict the end of capitalism. But uh, let me put a very important point or hypothesis here. Uh, capitalism and globalization started together. <clears throat> they started with the uh, capitalism in a way is globalization. It is always expanding, it is always globalizing. But there is a certain dialectics at work here. So uh, my hypothesis is that me, we may predict the end of globalization and probably we may see how globalization may put an end uh, to capitalism because my hypothesis is that globalization is a finite process. It, there is it's a process that can reach a, 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 a moment of completion, which may not say uh, a, a, about capitalism. But let me first start with a remark about <clears throat> the famous sociological novel by, by Zinoviev, of uh, The Yawning Heights. There he talks about an imaginary country he calls Ibansk. And I must... Uh, tell you that uh, maybe Bansk is not a place. Uh, it is a time. It is not a country, but it is an epoch. Because Zinoviev tells us how the end of history might look like. And I think that the book will be rediscovered in the future. It will be reprinted, it will be uh, commented again uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, maybe in the far future, or maybe in the near future when the, the processes are really because the processes are really, really dynamic. So uh, the question is, what will happen if nothing happens? That is to say, if there is no intervention, because now we live in times where we don't believe in revolution anymore. We don't believe in the possibility that we can intervene, that there may be some event of a revolutionary uh, <clears throat> nature that can break capitalism and start a new uh, kind of society. So let's try and see what will happen if nothing happens. Then we come to the, my next uh, hypothesis that the end of capitalism will come not as a liberation or revolution, but as a catastrophe. And uh, <clears throat> that's how we see uh, a much gloomier Ibansk at the end of history. We may see Ibansk as the, the finale of globalization. Because there is a certain process that we may call the shrinking of the world. Uh, there has been a lot of talk uh, since the beginning of the, of the century about the, the flat world, the flattening of the world in a kind of a positive sense. There is a book by Thomas Friedman called uh, the, 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 the World is Flat, where he tells us that uh, the world is flat in a very good sense, that there are no more these radical borders that there is freedom of uh, movement, freedom of communication. Uh, you know, the world is an open place where we can plug, play, compete, connect, and collaborate with more equal power than ever before. But what we see today is quite the opposite. The world is moving not in this positive uh, flatness, but is moving in another way. We live in a hot house, we live in a crystal powers where, uh, palace, where all the goods of the world are concentrated. And then there is another world which we don't see. And there are now inequalities which seem unabridgeable. Uh, there is a colonization of life by a technical rationality and the self-reproducing uh, power. This is what I call the dark side of globalization. Uh, it is also connected to the end of politics to the end of political pluralism and to, uh, connected to the end of difference of the parties, which Zinoviev predicted a long time ago. I think in the 90s he, he, he wrote about that. Now we see it already. Um, so uh, democracy is conceived of as a kind of a tool, a kind of a mechanism to support uh, the status quo. It is conceived of, if I may use this architectural language, Democracy is not a renovation anymore, it is just a restoration procedure, keeping and reproducing the order that we have today. It's just a reproduction of power. So <clears throat> we may say that um, 
maybe fundamentalism is the future of politics, a kind of a hegemonic thinking, where we return to a kind of a fundamental understanding and conceiving of the world and, 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 and the way we can act in the world. So uh, let me come back to the point of uh, globalization. Globalization is something like, it says something like that, this is your life and there is no other. This is the way globalization is working today, which doesn't mean that globalization itself is something bad we should oppose at any cost. I believe that we may have another different project for globalization, which also Alexander Zinoviev called an outer uh, globalization. Uh, so there is a chance, but I still uh, work on the hypothesis, what will happen if nothing happens? And globalization goes on, and capitalism goes on, but it, by its own inertia, by its own uh, natural movement. And we see this globalization running really fast, really dynamic, and it also produces fears. It fuels, a conservative, it fuels conservative revolutions all around the globe. So <clears throat> let me explain my point of, uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning, that globalization is a finite process, and that globalization is complete, uh, contrary to capitalism, which is never complete. In a certain sense, there is no end of capitalism uh, when, we, when we conceive of it just by, by itself. Uh, so globalization is complete when there is a hegemony of global capital, politics, and reason, all hitched together, interconnected, inseparable, with no alternatives to it. This is the completion of globalization. It is a one-dimensional world, a kind of a hothouse, which will be also the end of capitalism, but it will be something worse than that. Now let's see the logic of it. Uh, <clears throat> another hypothesis, another point I'm putting here, is that we should define modernity not by uh, economic growth, or growth of production, but rather we should define it by a growth of power and also a new forms of power, surveillance, thought scripting, desire, mass media, self-discipline, culture industry, etc., etc., biopolitics, uh, genetic engineering is also uh, power tools. So <clears throat> another very important point I want to make Maybe we <clears throat> think of the completion of globalization in a horizontal manner, which means a global monopolization and unipolarity of the world. That is to say, when the world becomes one. But there is also a vertical globalization. In the completeness, the end of globalization comes then when we have not only the horizontal process complete, but also the vertical process. Let me explain what I mean. This vertical uh, globalization consists of <clears throat> kind of vertical symbiosis. It is a globalization of different social spheres, different social agents, and also different spheres of knowledge and economy. This means that at some point, we may experience a merging of public and underground economies, a merging of legal and black markets, we may experience a merging of criminal, commercial, and political powers. And we already see that with the, new, uh, with the cryptocurrencies, deep web, you know, the, the new digital economies. Everything becomes one. And when all is one, nothing is legitimate anymore. This is a very important point here, because a state of illegitimacy of order, and we already experienced something like that, this state of illegitimacy, is a revolutionary state. Let, us re uh, let me remind you of Russia in 1917. That was exactly what happened. It was a total illegitimacy of the whole political <coughs> order at the time, and it was a revolutionary state. Another important point uh, is the dialectics of globalization and the dialectics of technology. 
because globalization started also with the rise of technology and was always moved by new uh, technologies, new forms of, of technological power. But today we reach a point where these technologies may produce a kind of a super class or superhumans, and then also subclasses and subhumans, which means that we will have an unsurmountable in inequalities, inequalities that cannot be, uh, you know, the gap between them cannot be filled. There was uh, here uh, a point made about Ray Kurzweil and the singularity moment. <clears throat> I will come to that in a few in a few moments because we reach something like that. Technology produces a new kind of humans, and then we have these insurmountable uh, inequalities, and that is also not capitalism because capitalism, from its beginning, it all, always had as a kind of a promise um, <clears throat> the idea that uh, the idea of social uh, movement, the idea that you can become more, that you can earn more, that you can start with a few dollars and you can become a, okay, this is a myth, of course, uh, especially today uh, in the contemporary state of capitalism, but still, when you have a situation of unsurmountable inequalities that has nothing to do with capitalism anymore. And <clears throat> let me, in the end, just mention Nietzsche, who used to talk uh, about the last man who is the goal of modern society and Western civilization. And also this last man who is tired of life, who takes no risks and seeks only comfort and security. The last man chooses pathetic comforts over life. And let me finish with something like that. Uh, there is a certain kind, I think, a certain kind of time paradox of modernity. Because in traditional societies, in pre-modern or pre-capitalistic societies, the way time was thought about, especially the future, was like that. Future is somewhere far away. Future <clears throat> is in the end of history. Then, in modernity, it, uh, the situation kind of changed. Future is now. In, in, in the modern world. Future is now, future is today. We already live in the future. We are the people of the future. And the next step, in a more pessimistic manner, the next step is that future becomes a past. There is no future to expect. We may discuss that in the, at the round table more. <clears throat> so we have this absolute shrinking of the world. And let me come back to uh, the example of Ibansk. In Ibansk, there is no tomorrow. The clocks obey a new mechanism of time, since time is a social category. It is also a very important point. Time is not just a physical uh, uh, you know, concept, it is also a social category. Our way of life defines how time is running. Our social experience gives time a shape. So, uh, the clocks uh, in the bands, they obey a new mechanism of time, and they're ticking backwards towards a state of singularity. That is what I described, you know, the shrinking of the world when everything becomes one, commercial, criminal, political power, it all merges into one. We, can, we have this kind of, of singularity, which is the end of capitalism. Todor, Todor, I, yes, I'm, I'm finishing last sentence, yes. So, uh, then dialectically, at this point of a singularity, all the future is ahead of us once more. And maybe this singularity will be at the same time the chance for the future. It will be a new, pos a new possibility of time. Thank you. No, очень интересная позиция, любопытная. Если коротко для тех, кто не понял, не имел наушника. Capitalism will win all of the world. Capitalism will be global, but when it turns into a planetary uh, status, it will reach its uh, end. Capital will no, no longer be important, 
power will be important. So this is this uh, super society that Zinoviev wrote, wrote about. And then uh, there was this idea how this anti-capitalistic revolution might happen. And now let's listen to our friend from China, Wang Haiking, vice president of International Center for uh, Research and Culture, named after Zinoviev. I'm the second time attend. This is a very famous conference. I'm very, very proud. Of. In the first, I must say thanks to Olya Dinovieva. Спасибо большое. Now, uh, before I answer uh, Vladimir Lebihin's question, what I want to speak today is uh, Mr. Professor Alexander Dinoviev's birthday. In these days, I read a lot of Russian book, Russian Christ belief. Inside, some content said, our all life come from what, where? come from the God, the God. I think, I think we must say thanks to the God. Now, I answer uh, Vladimir Lebihin's question. Yes, I'm very happy. I'm very lucky. Uh, I'm from China. I enjoy and new China develop environment. I enjoy uh, in China many plenty of opportunity to de develop my company, to develop what uh, our team do something for now new China. About socialism and uh, capitalism, what my opinion my opinion is what's the benefit, what's the feedback for any countries is the best. In China, our China, uh, there are about 3,000 years history. This is 3,000 years history produce Chinese Ru Shi Dao. This three system consist Chinese philosophy and the belief system. I think every country have right can choose every country's development system. I think philosophy is basement of every nationality and every country. But in my opinion, the first in very most important is belief. In Russia, how Russian belief? I work from far east of Russia to west of Russia. I visit many, many church, Russian church. What my opinion, philosophy is the basement of every nationality. But the belief, belief is the most, most important for every country. This is my answer to Vladimir Lebihin. The second, I want to talk about what I can study from Alexander Genoviev's book and some idea. Today, I want to speak two words. 
criticize and betray. In Mr. Alexander Dinoyev uh, with the book, he talked a lot about criticize. Criticize means every day must make a conclusion for everyone. Make a conclusion means criticize by myself. If good, okay. Encourage and keep. If something is wrong, a little change. This is, uh, means criticize. Criticize not means destroy. Mr. Professor Alexander Genevieve, during about 20 years in Germany, in other countries, he never destroy his motherland. Yes, he criticized someone. For what? For really he would like, he hope, help, and do something good for his motherland. I think this is why Chinese people respect Alexander Genovev very, very much. This is the second what I want to speak. The third, I want to talk about one common and famous lady. Her name is Olya Genovieva Midorovna. <laughs> why I want to talk about her? One day, in his house, I asked her, Olya, my dear teacher, yes, I regard her as my teacher, as my Russian mother. I asked her, why you are so busy, compete for every hour, every minute? Why? For what? She think a little. Sequent, quickly give me answer. Vanya, this is my mission. I must keep my promise to my dear husband. Keep promise. I ask her, what's your promise to Mr. Alexander Dinoviev? She told me, Vanya, when my dear husband go to heaven, he told me, Dear Ola, you can do, you must do, you can do, accept, continue my mission to this nationality, to this motherland, to this world. Ola told me, Vanya, I quickly, immediately give my husband the answer. My dear husband, don't worry, I can do. Now, she is not very young yet. Yeah, she is very beautiful, uh, she is very young. But for what? This is mission. This is responsibility, responsibility to this country, to this world. Finally, what I want to speak, I would like do from by myself, do from my Chinese team. In this year, my team established Alexandra Genoviev International Cultural Center in China, Beijing. What I want to do, I would like introduce Alexandra Genoviev's idea, philosophy, to Chinese people. I hope I can, my team can work as a bridge between China and Russia. Of course, including all over the world, other countries. 
uh, I hope in the near future, all of friends welcome visit China, Beijing. Thank you. Да, после выступления нашего китайского товарища возникает This global capitalism that will eventually uh, win in the world, according to Todor Todorov and prediction of uh, Juliet Keza, this uh, capitalism will it be Chinese, Chinese speaking or English speaking. One more speaker uh, requires no introduction, a well known movie director, actor, producer, TV a host, uh, thinker, and so on and so forth. Uh, Nikita Mikhalkov. Well, I am hardly a speaker because in a sense I am an alien at this feast of life, uh, celebration of life. Uh, philosophers spoke about global stuff here, globalism and capitalism. I don't want to take that risk. I don't want to try to compete with any of them at all. Because a lot what has been said are things that I never uh, thought about that deeply because I have my own uh, profession and my own things to do. Anything that's been said, with ex 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 except what the last speaker was talking about, almost uh, none mentioned faith and religious self-identification of a human being. And uh, that is the origin of our ethics, of our feelings, of our uh, behavior, uh, our morality. Anything that, anything that has been said uh, rules out morality at all, as if there is no morality whatsoever. When we say words like multiculturalism or tolerance, we forget about the most important things, our ideas of uh, right and wrong, good and evil. What, what would you say? What do you think? Does it matter that most leaders of most major countries have no children? How can they re imagine a future for themselves if they have no kids? If they have no idea what a child is like, what it is to be a mother or father, what can we even talk about? Uh, pulling people out of uh, beakers and uh, we're talking about the death of humanity, but imagine for a moment Dante, Michelangelo, Dostoevsky, Shishkin, the entire development of humans. And, okay, let's imagine that everything disappeared. Then what is there to live for? Philosopher Ivan Ilyin said, you leave something for, uh, or you live uh, for something that you're willing to die for. What can Europe die for today? For comfort, Europe betrayed itself. Europe doesn't, lo doesn't exist any longer. They betrayed themselves. They think that if they have the EU, if they get together, if 15 old men get together and they will make one young person, no, this will be uh, the house for the elderly, the institution for the elderly, but there'll be no continuation for this 
huge core of European culture as such. Tolerance that led to Europe filled with people who don't want to speak their those languages of those countries. They don't want to get to know that culture. They despise their hosts, those who whose countries they visit. And they are willing to die for what they believe in, for Islam. And they actually die for Islam. And they take the lives of Europeans with them. And they have no doubt whatsoever uh, regarding what they're doing. It, when you look uh, at um, uh, the young father, young dad, uh, an Italian film, you, uh, you can say that how wonderful it is what we see th in this film. But if I look at this uh, with the eyes of a Muslim, uh, I would say, what are you talking about? If you are uh, telling this about the pontiff, uh, just, you know, get out you will never be able to stand up for what you believe in. You lost this uh, faith. You dissolve yourselves. You're just uh, covered by the uh, Uncle Sam's nuclear umbrella. And this is a huge paradox, in fact. Who, in today's world, uh, uh, flexes muscles in front of the entire world, the country that has never had any war on its own territory. And this is the largest threat since uh, generations who know what war on your own territory means. Uh, uh, they know uh, what comes with it uh, when everything is at war. Th there is this sense of horror of war, but people, yes, uh, they had coffins coming from Vietnam, from Iraq, but this is a tragedy for a family, not for a nation. Just uh, look at how Hollywood created this uh, fantastic uh, idea of uh, negligence in the face of death thousands of people are dying on screen and no one feels sorry for anyone uh, Dostoevsky wrote crime and punishment where an old lady is killed and he describes the suffering that this person goes through the horror for uh, uh, the crime that he committed a deadly sin uh, to kill a person and uh, this uh, negligence of sin and uh, my uh, grandfather Kanchelovsky uh, said that a society without fear uh, can be uh, g managed and governed only by uh, force uh, and this is why we're getting these police states uh, in the world and uh, in the global uh, context. Uh, do we understand ourselves who we are and what we represent? Do we think why there is so much opposition against us? Uh, why we're getting all these blows? Uh, why? Why is it happening? It is all happening because we are not in the fold. We, unconsciously, we do not want to be part of this uh, process. We do not want church to celebrate single-sex marriages. We want uh, uh, to have uh, court cases when someone looks uh, at the knee of a woman in an indecent manner. We do not want this. Uh, and if we lose it, and Mr. Chiesa uh, was right when he said that Russia, China and Iran and probably India also. These are the country where yes means yes and no means no. Just look at uh, all uh, 
how the situations, uh, how the decisions regarding Russia are being taken, if we're unable to understand the significance of what is happening with our mentality and what they want to do with us, this uh, centuries-old global plan of uh, eliminating of anything that runs counter to the system. Zizhinsky said that communism has been destroyed, all is left is to destroy orthodoxy. What This is what actually going on right now. And I think uh, I will, cannot speak in global terms, I will not speak about capitalism or politics or anything else. Uh, I'm interested in what is happening right here and right now. We have to understand it very clearly. Uh, why they do not want to see us or understand us, or let alone love us. Why they do not want us to be strong, independent. Why do not they do not want to treat us with respect. Why? Because we are the last stronghold. The last stronghold of what is uh, uh, called uh, the human being, human world with our own understanding of right and wrong, good and evil, morality and so on. We have to understand this. And uh, by the same token, we have to understand that when this is happening on the outside, when this surrounds us, uh, we have to understand of the responsibility that we have within the fortress that we call Russia. And we have to see and understand and know how uh, forces uh, exist on the inside that are ready to open the gates of this besieged fortress. And we have to have a clear understanding of all this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mihalkov. Thank you so much for reminding us of the faith. As for the values, uh, everyone uh, talked about the moral choices. So there is a paradox that uh, faith and ideology, any conservative ideologies has some values, and any liberal is guided by some kind of a moral choice, moral values. So this is a, an internal question. We have only a few min minutes left, and I would like to ask uh, uh, Olga, Madam Zinoviva, to maybe sum up our session. Um, dear friends, um, I would not like to say speakers, uh, uh, I would like to say thinkers, explainers, uh, who are in the panel today and uh, are taking an active part in this conversation. This is not a politicized debate and Mr. Mikhalkov was right and um, when he, in what he said about our country, about the faith that supported our country for uh, millennia and about the wonderful Russian spirit, the undefeatable uh, spirit. This is why no one likes us. Uh, we are not recognized as first class people because we are an, uh, people of an extra class, extra high class. Uh, Russia is unique, not only for its natural resources, not only because of uh, the vastness of his uh, geography, but uh, because of the main uh, foundation, founding element of our common house, of our nation, the Russian people. And I'm grateful to everyone who took the floor during this morning's session they express their pain for today's world in a different manner and we're, I'm glad that we find the right topic uh, for these readings and what makes our conference attractive is that we have children and adults, young and old, uh, who come here, researchers, students, engineers, 
and teachers. Um, so the entire country is represented at this conference and I'm grateful to everyone who took part in our first morning session. I will not use the word panel because someone, uh, you know, in Russian it may sound a little bit awkward. And I think that our first uh, session is uh, our first uh, part of our conference and now we'll have a break. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. You all have the program of the event, our schedule, and in quarter to two we will resume our conference and now